go to put it in a building, you need a whole bunch of other stuff to make it work. Right? If it's a solidly mounted machine, you need spring isolated beneath between the skin and the base and the foundation. You need a solid foundation to be able to support the weight of the machine. You need accessory equipment. One of the biggest and most important things in a building or a housing is airflow, ventilation airflow. We have to bring cool air up to the back of the generator so it can pull in to cool the generator. We have to bring cool air to the inlet to the air to the engine. And then we have to take that air across the engine and take all the heat from the alternator and the engine that's radiating into the room out. If we don't, the room gets hot and it shuts down. Usually you get a mounted fan which does that job. Some machines don't have a mounted fan and you have a remote radiator design that way specifically because you don't have the ability to move the air up. In order to get that air through the room, you've got to have air in Big openings. So you have very low restriction because these fans need low restriction. Well, of course, there's a trade-off for everything you do. As soon as you put a big hole in the wall, now you let all the noise out. So this is acoustic treatment on the air inlet, and there's equivalent acoustic treatment inside the air plenums on the air outlet. And these are, these are uh, ge geometric design ducts. I'll turn the light on behind you guys can look through. And I'll also do a little demonstration of this. You can see through where the uh, air ducts, what you're seeing behind there is the, the air doors and they'll open immediately after when you start. But what I'll do is I'll step to the side and then I'll close the door and I'll keep talking at a high level like this. <laughs> Louder. <laughs> can't hear you. We can't hear you. That's nice. It's a designed either cancels or absorbs the lower frequencies especially. When we get outside after this is running, you can hear the turbocharger whine a little bit high. Some of those higher frequencies get through, but they fade away quickly going away from the building because they're high frequencies. So, um, one of the big reasons we have to do this is we're in a, a mixed use area here. We have a, an industrial site, but Right over in that direction across the highway are residences, people's homes. And so the city of Fridley has said you won't export any noise. That's the, the sound the rules here are 50 or 55 dB is a lot. So we had to kill the noise coming in and going out, as well as put the exhaust up. And that wall over there has no openings in it. So that's that's that helped that a lot. Um, in order to power this entire facility in, in the easiest manner, we generate at our incoming distribution voltage. We don't generate at 480, which is the utilization voltage in the facility. We generate at 13,800 volts and tie right into the main utility at the entrance to the, to the building. Um, some other things to think about. Um, Transformers that provide facility power for the room, sometimes that's needed. Um, room, room heaters. When we first built this room, the first winter, they didn't have any auxiliary heat in the room. And each of these machines has 12 kilowatts of electric block heaters running. They all ran, and it was cold in here, and they ran all winter. And when the electric bill came through, somebody looked at it and panicked. I won't use the word I was thinking about. And they said, we need to add, we need to add auxiliary heat in the room. So we've added heaters that keep the spacing. We hold it about 60 degrees during the winter. After they're started, it doesn't matter. We pull the cold air through. But uh, we knocked down the electric uh, and the use of those poor heaters, they cycle, you know, they cycle all the time. So they were cycling so much that I think in the first winter we replaced almost every heater, every block heater. Uh, another 
another piece on this way that's kind of interesting is you look at this demonstration. This is the cabling, 500,000 circular mil cabling, five, three phases in neutral and a ground that you would have if this were a four A volt machine, you'd probably six of these per phase and conduits going into switch gear. And of course, it's also interesting to see that this, you kind of talk about this is allegedly flexible cable, right? <laughs> no way. So it's, it's hard to pull that stuff. But if you think about all that copper as compared to when we generate at 13,000 volts and we're at about a, a 100 amps or 90 amps rated current, we only really need this. I mean, it's expensive, high voltage cabling, but it's only about a two, two gauge cable to carry the current. So it changes the perspective. It's kind of a trade off between the generator that costs considerably more at 480 volts and you know, all the conduits and copper and routing and physical size of, of, of low voltage, 480 volt, you know, 4,000, 5,000 amps switch gear. So it becomes a trade off depending on what your application is. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions about any of that? We have four units that will pull the, actually the, currently our usage in this facility is about three, three and a half megawatts. So we can take that, we can carry that with three units. But uh, we have four. Could you describe what the rest, I mean, obviously that pink one is the power coming out. What are the rest of those conduits? Like the, rest control, of, the rest of them are control conduits. Control? Yeah. And some of them are now empty since we went switched digital. over and went digital because a, a lot of that wiring got replaced by a single twisted pair communication cable. Okay. But they're all, those are all control conduits. They're control conduits that transfer data from the generator to the master control that transfer commands from the master control to the generator, to start, to stop, to whatever. They transfer commands from this generator control to the circuit breakers. The generator control controls the breaker in, this, in our, the way we approach parallel control. So they control the circuit breakers over there. There's also voltage sensing, voltage sensing on the bus, for synchronizing. All those functions have to come back and forth by a either hard wires or network communication hardware. We don't do any of that wireless. We keep it wired at this point. Um, Tim, most of them are not familiar with the diesel engine set. If you just want to show them what, what the major component of a diesel engine set, this is the first time we've been around one. Okay, well, just the now. basic, basic stuff. Yeah. What if I make a mistake? <laughs> You know, just I can always use the excuse, <laughs> I'm electrified. <laughs> so, we have an engine. It's like any engine. It's got a crankshaft. It's a V engine. It's a V16 cylinder engine. Here's the, here's the valve cover for each cylinder. The 16. And below it is a head. This is the head. Removable head. The core block is there. So the head is removable. The sleeve liner of the cylinder is removable so it can be completely rebuilt. Uh, obviously air intake comes in, filters, turbochargers, exhaust goes out on the one side of the turbocharger and then the fan on the other side compresses the air in. Inside here is a, essentially a heat exchanger that cools, it's called low temperature after cooling. It cools the compressed air before it goes into the cylinders. The, uh, this is the high pressure diesel fuel pump driven off the gear off the front of the engine. It provides, after the filtration, it provides high pressure fuel to the, to the injectors, and the injectors are controlled. This is a mechanical engine, but the injectors are controlled electronically on most engines today. What's the major work tomorrow? Say that again? What's the major work It, it takes the inlet air and pressurizes it. So we can, in here, the, the intake air pressure to the cylinders is under pressure, so it can drive more air into the cylinder. To cool it. To cool it. No, to make to more make, power. Oh, to make more power. Okay. Pressurizes the intake air. Okay. That's what a turbocharger does. Okay. In this case, the fuel is injected in a diesel directly into the cylinder at firing time. Okay, it's compression ignition. 
It's such a high compression that when they inject the fuel, it immediately ignites. In a spark ignited engine, the fuel is coming in through the turbocharger and through this mixed with the air, mm. and then it compresses and it doesn't ignite until the spark plug sparks. Mm. So by turbocharging, you could run an engine like this with no turbocharger. It's what we call naturally aspirated. So it sucks air, just pulls it in like most automobiles. Do. Uh, but you get a lot more power out of the engine if you can turbocharge it. And it also will perform better at higher altitude. Quick question. On most generators I've seen, it's like the fuel's on the bottom. Where's the fuel for all these? Or? These, this is the fuel coming in here okay. and going and return. A diesel engine always return, always flows more fuel than it consumes. There's always a little bit of fuel that feeds back up. It feeds here. This is a transfer pump. Its purpose is to take fuel from the tanks we'll look at in a minute into this little sub tank right here, which then feeds to the filth. Here's filth, fuel filters. See if I get this right. Then it feeds up into the high pressure pump. Did I say this right? Yes. Which then feeds out into the injectors of the machine. Okay. So, so your fuel is is away from the site, and it's just pretty much fuel pump, just like in a car. So. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, what about the? Can you explain the the purpose of the, the battery sets? The batteries are simply starting. Okay. Now they do provide power for the control. The control runs on tw 24 volts in this case. There's four of these batteries, two on each side. The other two you'll see here. And here's where you see the starters. There's two starter motors on these engines because they're big. So they both, both these starter motors run. They're just like a car with a solenoid. And the control system kicks the solenoids and then they close. And that's, that's really what the batteries do. Okay, thanks. Some engines do have options like they'll start with an air starter, a little starter motor that's air compressed, compressed air operated. You'll have a big tank nearby with a compressor. Um, kind of unusual in, in our kinds of, of markets. Uh, in certain locations where they don't want it to depend on batteries or they don't want any electrical sparking going on, gas fields and things, sometimes they use air starters. So there's two coolant loops in here. One is in the engine block. One is in this engine after cooler in here. There are two separate cooling loops, and they go out into the radiator core, which are actually two cores. That's pretty much con constant or common. Um, what else? This is a little breather tank. This is an extra thing that added on after many years. Um, what it does is it takes the crankcase blow-by and it's an additional filter to reduce fume emissions into the, into the atmosphere. A lot of engines these days now take that blow-by and recirculate it into the intake of the engine for emissions control. Um, what's your average life expectancy of you know, a generator this size? This size 20 years, this one's still sitting here. So. Well, or how many starts? It, it depends on. <laughs> yeah. It depends on the usage. The the in standby when it's only going to run a, a small number of hours a year. I mean, I don't know what we think. I think a machine like this will last 30, 40, 50 years. As long as it keeps running, you maintain it. It it won't wear out in that amount of time. If you put a machine like this into a continuous duty operation where it's running 24/7. Probably at about 30,000 hours, you're going to have to do some overhauling. Maybe 50,000 hours, you're going to have to do a major overhaul. And uh, I don't know, 100 or 150,000 hours, you're going to have to do. You're going to, it's going to be worn out. <laughs> Maybe one or two major overhauls. But so you got about 8,000 hours of running a year, approximately. But maintenance, you're... maintenance is the key, just like the benefit. Maintenance is the key. You've got to take care of it, right? and you've got to run it. If you don't run them, yep, just like <laughs> worst thing possible. Standby genesis and never run. Don't start when they're needed. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to test it once in a while. Run it. We run these 
with our interruptible system, you know, maybe a handful of days a year we'll run four or eight hours on this system. Um, and we'll demonstrate it like we're going to do here in a little while. Probably between two and five times a week we start these things and run them for half an hour. Okay. So we don't have an, an exercise program. It's kind of automatic in our demonstration. Okay. What do you recommend for your clients? Usually, um, what do we say now? Once, once a month minimum for 30 minutes of, of for loaded exercise. operating time for exercise. For exercise. Okay. And then a lot of places, a lot of depends on the type of application. Codes will require sometimes that it, the op, the operator tested a certain amount, like the NFPA emergency codes 110, for example. Or they'll say, okay, if you exercise it once a month for 30 minutes, or so you can do that, no load. But at the end of the year, once a year, you've got a load racket to. 70% load or 100% load. So you may have an additional requirement for okay. exercising, depending on safety codes. And depending on the customer's need for reliability. If you really want to test, tech a, excuse me, tech, test a system, you can't just start the engine and say, okay, it starts and shut it off. <laughs> You've got to switch the power and make it work and make sure everything is working like it's supposed to. In here, you don't have a, I don't know if you talked about load banks, but you don't need a load bank with this uh, arrangement here. You just go live? No, or, that's right. We yeah. don't use a load bank because we load it every time against our facility. We pick up the load of our. Of but our, if you have a standby where you don't want to go on, you know, on the load, then you have to have some type of resistor bank or yeah. a yeah. setup that you can actually apply the load. Because just like Tim said, you don't want to run it without loading it. 